Growing up in Arizona and now living in Southern California, Mambele is no stranger to Mexican food. And one of my favorite dishes is a simple quesadilla. Cheese, tortilla, that's about it. What makes quesadillas so interesting from a historical perspective is that they are the perfect combination of pre-Columbian cuisine and post-Columbian cuisine, meeting for one magical dish. So today, using a recipe from 1831, I'm gonna show you how to make quesadillas cernidas, or sifted quesadillas. And we'll focus on the pre-Columbian ingredient, corn tortillas. Esta vez, in Tasting History. So I am totally geeking out today because I got to work on this episode with a historian hero of mine, Professor Ken Albala. Ken is a professor at the University of the Pacific and has authored many books on food history which have appeared as sources here on Tasting History. Most recently, he created a series of videos for the great courses called Cooking Across the Ages, and I'm going to link to that in the description. You should definitely go check it out. He is a font of knowledge, and I'm just so grateful that he agreed to work with me on today's recipe from the 1831 Cocinero Mexicano for Quesadillas Cernidas, or Sifted Quesadillas. Take it away, Ken. Sifted quesadillas. Put your corn to cook with water, being washed and let it dry. Grind it and sift. Mix with the dough a little melted lard, salt, and a little of the settled tequesquite so the dough is workable. Sprinkle with flour and form into a wheel, well flattened in the way you like, and put in the middle a little aged cheese or fresh according to the preference of each one. Fold over the edges so they stick, at this point, put them into very hot lard, bathing continuously each so they puff up. Take them out and drain them and eat them fresh. So it's definitely recognizable as a quesadilla, but it's also a little bit different than one that you'll find in a Mexican restaurant, at least here in America or most parts of the world. Those are usually made with flour tortillas and heated on a comal or, or just a flat surface rather than frying them. But these, are fried in lard, and you can't be mad at that. Also, the recipe mentions an ingredient that I'm guessing most people haven't heard of, I had never heard of it, and it's called tequesquite. What is tequesquite, Ken? It's basically sodium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, it's like baking soda, basically, but it's got sodium chloride and sodium sulfate in it, so it smells a little bit like sulfur. Sometimes it's used to uh, soften beans the way you'd use baking soda, but it's also a natural leavener. So that explains why the recipe says these quesadillas should puff up a little bit. Now, we're going to make two slightly different versions. He's going to uh, start off with full kernels of corn, just like the recipe says. I'm going to make a slightly easier version uh, that is also mentioned in the book, which uses masa harina that has already been pre-ground. And if you're going to make them at home, I'm going to guess this is probably how you're going to do it. That said, you can actually just buy the tortillas, because the book also says you can go ahead and just buy them, because even back in 1831, they knew that making tortillas from scratch was kind of a pain in the butt. So first, let's watch Ken make sifted masa that the recipe calls for using full kernels of corn. So get about two cups of dried field corn and boil them in water for about an hour until they're mashable. Then strain them out and let them dry for a bit. Then comes the hard part. Ken uses a huge mortar and pestle to grind the corn into a paste, which he then pushes through a sifter to give him a nice smooth dough, hence the term sifted quesadillas. This is not a task for the impatient. So now, as I mentioned, I'm going to be using pre-ground dried masa harina, and it's going to be similar to what Ken has, though his uh, still has the husks on it, and it's probably not going to be as fine. Um, but other than that, the flavors should be similar, except for one important difference. My masa harina has been nixtamalized, and you're probably saying nixtama what? And I promise I'm going to explain this magical process called nixtamalization later on, but for now, let's just get back to the quesadillas. So what you'll need for this recipe is one and a half cups or 180 grams of masa harina. Now masa harina literally means corn flour, but it is not the same as corn flour that you're going to get in the store. So make sure that you're getting masa harina or masa flour rather than corn flour. They're gonna turn out very, very different. One cup or 250 milliliters of warm water, one teaspoon of salt, two tablespoons of lard, plus quite a bit more for frying, if you don't want lard, you can go ahead and use whatever oil you want, but I'm going to use lard. 
two tablespoons of tequesquite water. So how you're going to make this tequesquite water is you take about a tablespoon of tequesquite and pour about a half cup of boiling water over it. Then you let the tequesquite settle and let the water cool, and then you just skim the water off of the top. Don't eat the actual rocks at the bottom. Now I read online that if you don't have tequesquite, you can use uh, baking powder, though it is not going to do the same thing exactly, um, but it is going to give it that same puffing effect, hopefully. Uh, but if you want to use tequesquite, I have a link in the description to where you can get that online. And four ounces or 115 grams of cheese. Now the recipe says to use either aged or fresh cheese, so that is basically every cheese that's ever existed in the world. Um, so I'm going to use Oaxaca cheese, but you can use whatever you want. So first, add your salt to the masa harina and pour in the warm water and mix together until you get a paste. Now, if you followed Ken's lead and used full kernels of corn, then you don't need to add the water. You have plenty in there, so just add the salt. Um, but from here on out, everything is the same. So next, add in your two tablespoons of melted lard and the two tablespoons of tequesquite water skimmed off the top. Then mix everything together. If you think the dough is a little too moist, then just add in some more flour, and if you think it's too dry, add in a little more lard or water. At this point, we're ready to make our tortillas. Now you can either just uh, roll them out with a rolling pin, or you can just make them uh, flattened with your hands, but if you have a tortilla press, now is the time to use it, because they're just, they're so fun. So roll your masa into balls about the size of a golf ball, and then form it into a tortilla however you like. I'm using the press. Now with the press, you'll definitely want to uh, use some parchment or plastic wrap to keep it from sticking. Uh, the recipe says to put a little extra flour on there to keep it from sticking, but I tried that and it, it didn't work. So once your tortillas are ready, it's time to do as Richard Simmons commands and melt that fat in a skillet over medium-high heat. And while that fat heats up, it seems as good a time as any to check out the history of corn tortillas. The word for corn tortillas in the Aztec language, Nahuatl, is tlaxcali, and that literally means to bake. Ours are fried, so I don't even know if they count as corn tortillas, but I'm not going to think about that. Instead, I'm going to focus on that process that I mentioned earlier, nixtamalization, which every time I think about people just happening upon this process, it, it blows my mind. Uh, so let me break it down for you. The word itself comes from the Nahuatl word nixtamali, and it refers to ashes and corn dough. And essentially it was the process of cooking maize, or corn, in uh, water that had either lye, which came from the ashes of hardwood, or lime, which came from ground up mussel shells. Cooking the maize this way would break down the outside of the kernel, then making it easier to, to grind into masa. What makes it even more mind-bogglingly amazing to me is actually the side effect that happens when you nixtamalize corn, which the people probably did not realize. And that's the fact that besides moving carcinogenic aflatoxins, always a good thing to get rid of, uh, the process of nixtamalization also would allow niacin, or vitamin B3, to be absorbed by the person who's eating it. So Ken's version of his sifted masa it hasn't gone through the process, so it's going to be very deficient in niacin. And that's fine, because by the 19th century, people in Mexico were getting niacin from other food sources. But before the Spanish came, the main source of niacin needed to come from corn, because that was the staple of the diet. And if you're eating mostly corn for your diet, not putting it through the process of nixtamalization can lead to a host of diseases, including pellagra, which can cause horrible dermatitis, hair loss, and even dementia. So it's very important that they came up with this process, and it just amazes me because it is by no means universal. In the 15th century, when Columbus took maize back to Spain to be grown, he neglected to inform the people of the process of nixtamalization. And so it's not surprising that pellagra spread amongst the lower classes in much of Europe because they were eating mostly corn because it was cheap and easy to grow. And just like knowledge can spread, so can a lack of knowledge, because most of the places that Europeans then colonized had the same problem with this disease. The United States, the Congo, South Africa, India, in fact, still to this day in parts of India and China, the disease persists. So there's just one more thing that Columbus really kind of screwed up. Anyway, after the process of nixtamalization, the kernels would be ground mostly by women into masa using a cylinder-shaped stone called a mano and a concave stone base called a metate. 
We can actually see the process in a document called the Codex Mendoza, which was created around the year 1542, shortly after the Spanish conquest. Through the work of native Aztec artists, it documented the history of the Aztec kings, as well as the daily life of the people, including what they wore, how they fought, their religion, and even how they punished their children. Definitely more strict than my parents, much worse than a timeout. Mays is also mentioned in Hernán Cortés's second letter to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. It's also one of the first mentions of corn syrup. The city has many public squares in which are situated the markets, where are daily assembled more than 60,000 souls engaged in buying and selling, and where are found all kinds of merchandise that the world affords, embracing the necessaries of life, as for instance articles of food, honey and wax from bees, and from the stalks of maize which are as sweet as sugar cane. Maize or Indian corn in the grain and in the form of bread, preferred in the grain for its flavor to that of the other islands in terra firma. Now, it makes sense that maize would be featured in both of these documents because it was an integral part to Aztec life. In fact, for an earlier civilization, the Maya, it was life. Literally. In the K'iche Mayan creation myth, the gods literally made humans out of yellow and white corn. If only the Aztecs had known that, then they wouldn't have had to rely on the feathered serpent god Quetzalcoatl to get it for them. Legend has it that long ago during the fifth sun, the Aztec people only ate what they could hunt or gather, but they knew of a plant that grew on the other side of the mountains that surrounded them called maize. They asked their gods to move the mountains so they could go get to this plant, but their gods said that the mountains were too great to move. Finally, they asked Quetzalcoatl, who said that they were still too big to move, but he would use his intelligence to go get the maize for the Aztec people. So seeing a red ant scurrying toward the mountains one day, he turned himself into a black ant and followed the red one. After several days of treacherous, perilous travels through the mountains, he came out on the other side where the maize grew. So he went up and picked up a kernel in his little ant pincers and brought it back to the Aztec people, who were grateful, though I'm sure that some people were like, couldn't have become a slightly bigger animal, brought back a, like, a bag of corn? because. We got a lot of people here to feed, so, but no, thank you. Thank you. And those mountains that surrounded the Aztec people would have been the Sierra Madres. So, despite what Humphrey Bogart might lead you to believe, the real treasure of the Sierra Madre was maize. Because archaeologists have found that maize was being grown and made into corn tortillas as far back as 10,000 years ago. So, while the cheese in our quesadillas might be relatively new, coming over with the Spanish from Europe, the corn tortillas have been around since the time of the Aztec gods. A perfect dish of New World and Old World come together, and I can't wait to get back to it. So once the lard or oil is nice and hot, take a bit of cheese and place it in the center of the tortilla, and then fold it over and pinch it closed all around the edge. If the tortilla breaks anywhere, just press that part down with your fingers as well. Then slip it into the lard, spooning some over the top as it fries. Now the recipe does not mention flipping this over, but the top never really got crispy. It, it got cooked, but never crispy. So I would actually suggest flipping it over uh, after about a minute. It's going to get crispy on both sides, and it's just much better. Also, don't overfill it with cheese, because the cheese will leak out and make a mess. Once it's nice and crisp and is puffed up a bit, Take it out of the pan and set it on a paper towel or something else to let it drain. Then repeat the process until you have as many quesadillas as you like, and eat them right away, because in the words of the cocinero mexicano, they will harden and get ugly. En mi casa yo no permito quesadillas duras y feas. And here we are, quesadillas cernidas, or sifted quesadillas. Little palate cleanser. Okay, I'm ready. Let's give this a shot. Mmm. Mmm. That's mighty fine. Mighty fine. They're really, really crispy. And because of the tequesquite, I guess, they're a little puffed up. You know, when you bite into it, you're getting those air pockets and everything. It's really, really good. The cheese is like all melty inside. Don't use too much. Uh, I think it could, could definitely overwhelm it very easily, but it's absolutely perfect. And then the crisp shell, it's almost like a like a tostada shell, it's, it, I mean, it is, uh, essentially. Um, absolutely wonderful. So what do you think, Ken? How are yours? Can I just tell you how good these things are? 
Mm. Listen to that crunch. <laughs> that crunch. Mm. So if you're enjoying Tasting History, make sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram where I post pretty much daily, but once or twice a week I'm posting short videos called Facts by Max, which are historical stories that didn't necessarily fit into an episode, but that deserve to be told. So I will see you over there, and I'll see you next time on Tasting History. <laughs>